Anyway, anyway, my name is Max Donath. I'd like to welcome you to our advanced uh, transportation technology seminar. Uh, we have a very interesting speaker today, but before I introduce our speaker, I'm going to have uh, Hannah uh, basically give you a quick update on what you guys need to do in, in participating in the seminar. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Um, as most of you know, we do have an online audience as well as an in-person one, so please hold your questions to the end and use the microphone so our online viewers can hear what you're asking. Um, for those of you online, please type your questions into the chat box in the upper right-hand corner and we will ask them to our speaker at the end of the presentation. Please also report how many people are watching from your location. We're required to report these numbers to the USDOT and we'd appreciate an accurate count, so thank you. Moving very quickly, I would like to welcome uh, Per Gardner, uh, who is going to speak today. Um, he, uh, his background is uh, rather unique. He received his PhD in pedestrian safety uh, from the University of Lund in Sweden in 1982. He worked at the Royal Institute of uh, Technology in Stockholm uh, for uh, nine years, was a postdoc with uh, Professor Ezra Hauer, uh, in, uh, at the University of Toronto for a year uh, and uh, has worked at the Highway Safety Research Center in Chapel Hill for some time and joined the University of Maine, has been on the faculty at the University of Maine uh, since 1992. So without further ado, I'm going to welcome Professor uh, Pierre Gardner to talk to us on pedestrian safety, pedestrian behavior, and intersection design and control. I would come to you Mic not on. Not on, maybe. I must uh, preface that with uh, saying that when I was a young engineer, I believed that uh, education and enforcement was the way to improve pedestrian safety. We all know that 90% of accidents are caused by human behavior, and therefore the belief would be that 90% of crashes can be eliminated with intervention on the humans, but uh, like I was taught by people who are experts in education, it's not that simple. And uh, my conclusion has been that not only have we already reduced pedestrian risk by roughly 90% in many European countries, the 10% that remain, 90% of those can also be reduced by continuing engineering, not just civil engineering. Mm -hmm. But before we get to uh, the uh, accident and the bad consequences, the negative consequences of walking, we have to remember that walking is good for us. And we often hear that, but it can be quantified. There's at least two great studies that I would like to point at. One is a French study from 1997 by Carré that shows that for every hour we walk, we add one hour to life statistically. In other words, when you walk, you don't waste time. You get it back at the end of your life. Some people are, of course, not living up to that. We have premature deaths from cancer, other things, even for people who exercise. There's no guarantee. But on average, we live longer if we exercise. And recent research from Harvard and other places following many adults show that Ideal is just over an hour a day of moderate exercise, such as brisk walking. If we exercise more than that, longevity takes a hit. So it is not that we should be involved in massive exercise, just walking is good. But it has to be safe and it has to be inviting to walk in cities to provide good sidewalks like in Chicago here, which are separated from automobile traffic and nice benches to sit on. They can be even better ergonomically designed than that bench, but uh, it is important that we have safe places to walk. And most cities have safe places to walk along streets. When it comes to the countryside, that's not always the case. Uh, the worst example is where I walk from my house to my shopping mall. I have to cross an interstate with a four inch shoulder and fast traffic in every lane and, uh, and there is no, there is no alternative. There used to be a cattle tunnel, but because the cattle tunnel was not handicap accessible and safe for walking, they closed it down. So now the only place to walk 
to Bangor Mall from downtown Bangor is to walk on that bridge. That's not how it should be. We can often see that where there are no sidewalks, people keep walking until there are paths. On bridges, we don't have that option. Uh, this is uh, a town in, in uh, Maine where they recently installed the sidewalk. They also widened the shoulder at the same time. Wider shoulders are good for bicyclists, but it also makes people drive faster. And it's my belief that we should have moved the curb out to this point. For a rural location, we should have the bicycles mixed with pedestrians up in the protected zone. I know that many of you disagree, but as a European, I can say it, that bicyclists should not be mixed with cars. And we should, if possible, protect pedestrians like on Montessori Island, this is a federal highway, not a state road. It's in the national park and they can do what they want. And obviously, if you hit these rocks at the high speed in the automobile, you're not safe. But at least pedestrians are protected. Better way of doing it may be to put guardrails, like in Sweden, between the sidewalk pedestrian bicycle path and uh, automobile traffic. And, uh, it's pretty obvious what we should do along highways. What is the issue is how do we cross roads? How do we get from this somewhat safe path to this somewhat safe path? How do we cross not just valleys, how do we cross streets? And to step out into the street is often perceived as falling down from Acadia National Park it shouldn't be that dangerous. When you're walking in a city, you should be allowed to get to the other side without risking your life. And of course, providing tunnels is the ideal, but uh, we cannot afford and we cannot build tunnels everywhere. I've been working on uh, how to cross uh, streets in a safe way since I started my research and my PhD thesis, as sp pointed out, pedestrian safety and traffic signals a study carried out with the help of a traffic conflicts technique, and I will be talking more about the results later on. I also worked, as, as uh, Max said, uh, with Esra Hauer doing research on traffic conflicts, how to validate them, and, uh, and um, it seems like traffic conflict studies is a good way of uh, coming up with estimates of accidents. I have... Uh, used actual crash data studies too in many of my studies. One of them I will be talking more about later too is impact of speed and other variables on pedestrian safety. But already now I will say that gathering data from 122 locations was not quite enough to get good uh, conclusions. But the conclusions that can be drawn is that low speed and narrow roads are important. And uh, to show people that they're entering towns, having town gates is something we should use much more, uh, I think, to show people they're going from a rural environment into an urban. Unfortunately, in the United States, we barely have urban and rural environments anymore by suburbanization of rural areas, exurban areas. I have also tried to find out information on different types of hawk systems uh, in street lighting rectangular flashlights, and there may be studies coming out. But it's really hard to find good accident data studies on the effect of these measures. There is a lot of studies showing, including studies I've done myself, on yield rates. But what does that mean to pedestrian safety? That's not a very obvious, uh, uh, obvious answer. If we increase the yield rate from 10% to 25%, obviously you will wait shorter time. If we increase it to 50%, it becomes better. But what about increasing it to 80%? Is that better than 50%? Increasing it to 99.2%, is that safe? And my contention is that it's starting to become unsafe when we get up to those high rates. When we have 99% of cars yielding, pedestrians will start walking out in front of vehicles, assuming they will stop. When 50, 60 percent stop as a pedestrian, you will not walk out in front of them. You will take responsibility, and I will get back to data proving my point. If we want to slow down people to lower speeds, we can work with narrow lanes. And this is the most extreme narrow lane I've seen. It's from England, and as you can see, it is six feet, six inch curb to curb. 
Uh, when we talk about narrow lanes in the United States, we often talk about 14 feet or 16 feet from curb to curb. We talk about 10 foot lanes, but 10 foot lanes often have shoulders, so before we put the curb, and six foot six inches really slow people down. Observing vehicles going through, uh, they go at five miles per hour. They don't want to damage their, their uh, uh, rims. They don't want to hit the mirrors in the steel posts. And other ways of slowing people down is to have one lane streets where we only, where one direction yields to the other. We have tried that in Maine and found out that people try to get there first. It becomes speeding up to be there first. So in England, they frequently put in a speed cushion uh, so that it is really uncomfortable to drive fast. And by slowing everybody down, we get higher safety. Speed cushions can be used in front of any crosswalk. This is a picture from Sweden where we see a nice wide refuge island and we see the speed cushion being roughly 25 feet before the crosswalks. That means that pedestrian can see the car slowing down, not just at the crosswalk, but prior to it, so they are approaching slowly. We have uh, ballbouts and refuge islands in the United States too. Uh, using a roundabout in a corridor in San Diego meant they could narrow down the roads from four lanes to two lanes. In Germany, they have serious ballbouts at many places, and they, uh, combining ballbouts with refuge islands is probably the ideal way to make it safe to cross streets. But there are other ways of doing it. One way of doing it is like in Helsinki, they have speed cameras with a two kilometer per hour tolerance. If you're driving at 42 kilometers per hour, you get by, but when the speed limit is 40, which is 25 miles per hour, if you go three kilometers per hour above, you get fined. And uh, at traffic signals, uh, to have pedestrians cross where speeding vehicles run red light is dangerous, but not only people running red lights at hi high speed, people having green lights at high speed, because we know that pedestrians are, tend to jaywalk. This is right in front of the railroad station in Helsinki. There is a street car, like a light rail system, and people go from the train to the light rail. When the light rail is there, they don't wait. They want to get to the train, to the streetcar, and they jaywalk. And uh, even if it is illegal to jaywalk, slowing vehicles down to the posted speed limit makes it safer. Another way that is very imaginative uh, is in Los Angeles that I observed. This is from Google Maps. You can all go to Figueroa Street in Los Angeles, and you can see your speed is what it is. And if you go above the speed limit, by five miles per hour, this traffic signal switches to yellow and red just before you get there. And you have to wait 20, 25 seconds before you get the green light. It rewards people to keep the speed limit. Going one step more drastic than either of these is the trap door that they are starting to build in front of crosswalks in Sweden at toll plazas. When the speed is within the, uh, the uh, allowed level, it is completely flat, you just drive through it, but if you are speeding, it becomes a very drastic speed bump with a sharp metal edge that will damage suspension, alignment, possibly tires, and in Sweden they get away with it. A liability for the road administration is not such that uh, people can sue them. Sovereign immunity, I guess, in America too could protect DOT from damages, but maybe not. Um, it's just ideas what one can do. I've been working lately with uh, uh, pedestrian safety for children and elderly, and uh, one way of making it safer in, for pedestrians is to give them priority. And in Sweden, the yield rates were roughly 50, 60, 70 percent before they changed the law 15 years ago. And when they changed the law, the law used to say that pedestrians have the right of way in crosswalks but they were not allowed to step out in front of a moving vehicle that was so close that it could not reasonably stop. So there was some responsibility on the pedestrian and some on the automobile driver. They changed the law 15 years ago to say pedestrians have the right of way in crosswalks. Just like when you have the green light, you don't have to stop for the green light and wait for somebody having a red light to pass through. 
people are not allowed to enter on red lights. And why do we stop for red lights, but why do we not stop for pedestrians? That was the question. So they gave complete priority to pedestrians. Pedestrians jumping out in front of a car, if they are stupid enough to do it, will have the right of way. And they will be found correct, even if they are also found dead. The resulting uh, effect was a 27% increase in pedestrian crashes, giving pedestrian complete right of way and having almost completely eliminated with strict enforcement, they got the, re the uh, yield rate to be such that almost all cars always yield, but it became less safe. And uh, that study st uh, focused on young and the old and uh, uh, what I've been doing, and I just got the most recent data for pedestrian safety in Europe, England, or United Kingdom, Sweden, Norway, Finland, Germany. Those are the only countries where we have good pedestrian counts. I have crash data from all 25 European Union countries, but they don't have exposure data. How much do people walk in traffic? So these are the countries where we know where they spend enough money to count pedestrians enough to be able to estimate how many kilometers people walk. And we can see that the average crash rates in United Kingdom, Germany, and Finland are exactly the same, 0 0.77, 0 0.78, while in Norway and Sweden we have lower rates. We can also see that for all age groups, up to age 65, you are pretty safe as a pedestrian. And we don't include people who are below age 12 in this study, but uh, you can see that when people age, they become much less safe. And particularly the age group that is 85 plus uh, get really high risks. And if we want to encourage people to continue to walk when they give up their driver's licenses, they are too old to drive, they should be able to continue to function in society and walk. And uh, in all the countries, uh, we have uh, an increase in fatality rates for older people. In Finland, it is extremely bad for the oldest. Finland is a more rural country than the other countries. People walk in high-speed environments. I uh, was told by Max when I was invited I should be talking about some of my more recent presentations. This is a study called Explaining Pedestrian Safety Experience uh, at Urban and Suburban Street Crossings Considering Observed Conflicts and Pedestrian Counts. And uh, it's a study I did together with John Ivan and others at University of Connecticut. And uh, I uh, just want you to know that I am still working with regression models and uh, trying to explain effects of different countermeasures. But before I get to that study, I want to talk a little bit about pedestrian fatality rate. And if we normalize everything to 4.4 million miles walked, that is an estimate to come up with the rate one for United States. And we don't have good data, but the best estimate of how much people walk in United States show that the fatality risk of walking a mile in traffic in the US is three times higher than in Germany five, six times higher than in the Netherlands. And uh, if we compare uh, uh, Sweden to, uh, to these countries, as I showed in the previous slide, Sweden and Norway were the safest countries. It's roughly nine times more dangerous to walk in the United States than in Sweden. We can also look at it in this graph. We can see that Sweden peaked in traffic accidents with pedestrians in 1960. Uh, early 1960s, and the risk has been reduced to uh, about 15% uh, of what it was. If the United States reduces its risk from its peak that happened a few years later, we should be down to 1,000 pedestrian fatalities today. Instead, we have roughly 4,700 instead of 1,000. If we consider the fact that uh, uh, that um, people drive more in the United States. It could be a bit higher, but it could also be a bit lower because people walk less. If you walk less, there should be fewer fatalities. If we look at it in the population rate per pedestrian, you can see that 1.5 per 100,000 in the United States, 
average for 2009 to 2013 for Sweden is less than a third of that. So the population rate, if we go from the Swedish to the US, uh, three times higher, uh, we again should be roughly down here if we did the same improvements. And uh, there are lots of other studies. Uh, John Pusher at Rutgers uh, compared the United States uh, fatality rates for bicycling and walking between the US, Germany, and the Netherlands. And again, you can see that pedestrian fatality rate per 100 kilometers uh, traveled uh, is, uh, is uh, the, this one, 2.5 in the Netherlands, 4.4 in Germany, and 14 in the United States. Uh, not quite as drastic. This is a few years older. My data were the very latest. And things have improved in Sweden and Europe since then, since, uh, since uh, Pusher study. Things are improving in the United States too. For example, New York City have so far this year had 30% fewer fatalities with pedestrians than two years ago, including data up to uh, last month, I think it is. And um, we can see that uh, a thousand fewer pedestrians have been injured. The per reason, according to most researchers, is lowering the speed limit from 30 to 25 miles per hour and enforcing it by adding hundreds of new speed cameras. And they know that in many states like Maine and Minnesota, speed cameras are not legal. I said that I believe not in enforcement and education, but in engineering. But I do believe that enforcement may be a necessary part of coming to good safety. And uh, the speed, influence of speed is obvious. There is an old study by Teichgraber that shows that if you're hit at 50 miles per hour, you have a 2% chance of surviving. If you're hit at 19 miles per hour, you have an 80% chance of surviving. And that has been... Uh, uh, replicated with even lower risk of fatality at speeds up to roughly 20 miles per hour. And uh, that is collision speed. Traveling speed is higher. Usually people do take evasive action and slow down. It's also the shape of the vehicle. If you're hit by a big truck and you get under the wheels, you're obviously less safe than if you are thrown up onto the hood of a small passenger car. This is a study from Sweden showing and confirming that having 25 mile per hour actual speed on roads is enough to prevent fatal crashes. But if we want to prevent injuries, serious injuries, we actually need to have travel speeds of 16 miles per hour. And how low can we go in speeds for travel? Uh, 30 is the lowest you can ever go in Minneapolis, maybe. It would be politically impossible to lower the speed limit. Could we lower the speed limit at crossing facilities? Could we have lower speeds where lots of people cross on certain streets? And especially at traffic signals. Uh, this is a uh, few locations in Sweden have been rebuilt so that there are speed humps at crosswalks. Uh, if people run the red lights, or if people jaywalk. S camera speed enforcement is one way. Speed humps is another way of reducing speed. Speed humps are insensitive. They are there all the time. And no matter if there's a pedestrian or not, we only need a speed hump there when there is a pedestrian. So the trap door idea activated only when there is a pedestrian is a good idea. And the same should be for school zones. Why do we have signs? Like I drove by on this rural highway, you're going 55 miles per hour and you pass a sign, you barely even see that there is a sign. And you're supposed to read that these are the times when you're supposed to slow down for the school zone. Then you have to check your smartphone if you don't have a watch on, what time is it? Am I supposed to slow down? And you've already passed the school before you realize what speed you should have had. Obviously, like this picture I've stolen from maybe you, Minnesota DOT, uh, on uh, warning systems for railroads. 
when a train is coming, uh, we get the warning in the vehicle. It's obvious the speed limit should be inside the vehicle for school zones. It should pop up on a heads-up display or on our smartphone going onto a display in the vehicle. And it should only be activated not during certain hours, not uh, when children are present because we don't see the children in the dark. It should be activated whenever there is a child nearby. Children should be carrying a smartphone with a, or some type of key ring which send out a signal that they get in school. So when they walk to and from school, they are being detected by automobile drivers. And uh, one step of this has already been practiced in Sweden and Finland. That kids have key rings that activate flashing signs saying children nearby. And that is so much better than activating them certain hours. But ideally, it should go into the vehicles. This is uh, another study that I have uh, participated in where I use expert opinions. Instead of looking at uh, crash data, I ask experts in around the world, what do you think is the effectiveness of different ITS measures? When we don't have the measures developed yet, that may be the best way of finding out what the effect will be. It's obviously speculative, and what actually happens based on human factors may be very different from what so-called experts believe will happen. The most common way of doing research today, and I am an associate editor of Accident Analysis and Prevention, and I get hundreds of studies on regression analysis. And I'm not really an expert on regression analysis. I have done some work in it, and I was as good at it as most people at one time. Ezra Hauer is a much bigger expert than me. He has taught the world about how to do before and after study. Before Ezra wrote his book on regression effects, many engineers didn't know about uh, regression towards the mean and had very biased before and after studies. We still see very biased before and after studies being published where you have before data that is not corrected for uh, sampling biases. When it comes to regression analysis, many of you know, if you've been to TRB uh, or heard about Esra's research, that he is very skeptical of using regression analysis for finding the uh, uh, crash modification factors or other safety performance fac functions. But, uh, and I would recommend that many of you should read this book. And um, one of the conclusions is by Ezra, and he is a much smarter person than me, so now I will leave it to his mind and not my mind. The conclusion is that there is no comprehensive automated software. You should not believe that you can buy a software, enter data, and it spits out cash modification factors. What you have to do is use parametric curve fitting yourself. Don't use anything more complicated than Excel is Esra's recommendation. Don't buy a black box that you don't understand. Write all the functions yourself. Examine different types of, of uh, distributions and find alter try alternative functions until you get a good fit. When you get a good fit for one variable, you introduce the second variable. And his conclusion, even when that is done, is that he says, I do not think that regression based on cross-sectional data can be trusted to predict the effect of course. In this section, I will explain why. So I will continue with that. Uh, this is from his book. There is a study here that looks at average speed and accidents. And it's obvious that when we have interstates with high speed, this is not pedestrian safety, it's all accidents, high speed roads are safer because they are built in completely different ways. They don't have urban issues. Low speed roads are, if they have a speed limit of uh, 40, 45 miles per hour, they have uh, low uh, standards. And it's not surprising that we find a relationship which is the opposite of what we should find. If we do before and after study, when we raise the speed limit and lower the speed limit, we almost always find out that higher speeds give more injuries and more fatalities. The number of crashes may not change much, but 
injuries always go up when we increase speeds. There may be other factors introduced at the same time that bring accident numbers down. So Ezra said, this is not surprising. But to try to figure out why, to try to illustrate how uh, safety performance functions can be developed for four-lane roads, he, he included traffic volume, segment length, percent trucks, degree of curve, lane width, shoulder traits, driveways, speed limits, as explanatory variables. And obviously, there are many other variables you can think of, but those were the ones he studied. And he got surprised when he did a regression. He still found that when you have higher speeds, you have higher safety. The opposite of what all his before and after studies show. So uh, I'm not saying that you should stop doing regression analysis, but when we find out results that are not expected, we have to wonder, is there something wrong with my technique? And I said I would talk more about the uh, study that uh, I was part of, but before I get to that, just a few words about my old PhD study. What I found out from that one is that crosswalks that are located close to the curb extension instead of being pulled back from the curb extension, that are short crossing distances, that have refuge islands and have low speed. Uh, and I think this still holds true. Low speed intersections are safer than high speed intersections. And again, even though I had hundreds of data points, I couldn't divide them into many groups. And uh, of course, a more sophisticated analysis where we don't use yes and no could maybe get better results, but 19 miles per hour, 30 kilometers per hour was the average travel speed that was the divider. So even at such low speeds, uh, we get S25, we get double as many pedestrian crashes as when we stay below th 30 kilometers. And the road width was again what we found out. The uh, uh, refuge islands is something that is used frequently in Scandinavia and England. And one reason the US doesn't have as good pedestrian safety, I believe, is the lack of refuge islands. In Maine, where I live, we cannot have refuge islands because roads cannot be plowed, they say. So in Sweden, they have refuge islands that they remove in the winter at some places. And uh, they do, uh, in England, you can see two examples here of refuge islands, handicap accessibility, but no marked crosswalks. So in England, they believe that leaving it to pedestrians to find safe gaps and providing the necessary infrastructure in, in refuge islands is better than painting the stripe. England has a lot of those. In Sweden, they are starting to do them. Whenever the speed limit is above uh, 30 miles per hour, above 50 kilometers per hour, Sweden is, has stopped painting crosswalks. It is not safe to provide, to think that you can provide a safe crossing. In England, they haven't eliminated crosswalks. There are zebra crossings and pelican crossings. This is the zebra, flashing yellow lights, and raised refuge islands, short passageways, often mid-block, and they are really respected. People do stop for pedestrians in the zebras. The, this is one of the studies I promised I would say more about, the impact of speed and other variables. This is main data. You can see that just speed limit has a huge effect on probability of fatality. In 25 mile per hour zones in Maine, 2.2% of pedestrian accidents are fatal. In 55 mile per hour, 28%. So speed limit plays a role. In Maine, most towns do not enforce speeds that are below 40 in 25 zones. Some towns enforce 35. But Bangor, the city I live in, the second biggest city in Maine, if you look at fines issued by the police in a given year, there is zero fines where somebody is charged with driving between 25 and 40. They start at 40, 41, 42. And the police officer will not add when they write the ticket. They will probably reduce it and say, 
You actually drove 48, but I will be kind to you and write 40 on the ticket. So uh, there is, as opposed to in Helsinki, where they enforced two kilometers per hour, we have much higher speed. But in spite of that, you can see there is a huge difference in fatality risk. And uh, that study I did uh, in Maine, trying to figure out uh, difference between actual safety and predicted safety was 122 locations. I used the Swedish model and an English model based on regression just of traffic volume, nothing else. How many accidents do we have in the average English intersections? And for this Main Street downtown, the English model predicted 0.31 accidents per, uh, for the time period. The Swedish model predicted 0.28. If we look at all downtown Bangor intersections, the Swedish model predicted 4.24 crashes, the English predicted 4.23, and in reality there were three. In other words, downtown Bangor, low speed, narrow streets, has higher safety than the average Swedish or English location. But when we go to the outskirts of Bangor, the Swedish model predicted 2.12, English model predicted 3.27, and in reality there were double as many. And overall in Maine, there were double as many as there should have been, indicating that risks in Maine on average are double of what they are in England or Sweden for the same traffic volumes. I also looked at uh, different variables influence. I will be running out of time, so I will skip that one and get back to, uh, I promise that uh, to talk about that 99% of vehicles yielding is less safe than 50%. And this is a classic study by Herms. Bruce Herms in San Diego did a study in 1969. He found out that there were 5.8 times more accidents in the marked crosswalk than the unmarked crosswalk in San Diego, 5.8 times as many crashes. Then he went out with students and counted traffic pedestrian volumes. Traffic volumes were roughly the same through both because they were minor intersections. And he found out that there were 2.9 times more pedestrians crossing in the marked crosswalk. In other words, the risk was double in the marked crosswalk. I uh, organized a similar study in Sweden, and it was uh, carried out after I got my job in Maine by Lars Ekman, and uh, the exact same results were found in Sweden, that if you cross at an intersection in an unmarked crosswalk was the safest, to cross mid-block was much more dangerous, to cross in the marked crosswalk was 2.5 times, roughly the same as the two times found in, in uh, San Diego. Surprisingly, to cross at the signalized crosswalk was the most dangerous. And most people who are not familiar with traffic signals or engineering believe that that is the ultimate safety. Signalize the crosswalk and we have no accidents. But obviously, we have a few drivers running red lights when risks are very high, and we have a lot of pedestrians jaywalking. And especially when you're under the influence of alcohol, and 45% or something of US pedestrian crashes involve alcohol by one or the other party, and uh, uh, you don't look for cars. To get back to the study with John Ivan, using regression analysis, using very sophisticated regression analysis, trying lots of different models and odds ratios, the, uh, and basing the study on lack, knowing there was a lack of crash data, expanding the data with, with uh, traffic conflict studies at 100 locations, which is a lot of manpower to do manual observations at 100 locations. And the result was greater crossing distance and small building setbacks are both found to be associated with larger number of pedestrian vehicle crashes. We couldn't even draw the conclusion how much crossing distance leads to in a statistically significant way. And then that we found out that s small building setbacks had more crashes was absolutely the opposite of what we were hoping for and what lots of other studies have shown. And there isn't time to discuss the details of this, but one has to be very cautious, I think, when not including every variable that has to be included in uh, safety analysis. And uh, what we included here was traffic control, speed limit, 
refuge island crossing distance, number of lanes, on street parking and building setback. And only the building setback and the crossing distance became significant in the modeling, even though we had 100 locations. The last few slides will be on studies of accepted gaps. We often hear about studies of accepted gaps. Will this car drive out or not? He has a stop sign. When we study accepted gap, which gap do we study? We study the gap in major traffic, and we say that this person is making up his mind whether to accept or reject the gap, because this person has the right of way, and they are choosing gaps. When we look at pedestrians, we always do the opposite. Why is that the case? Pedestrians have the right of way, formally in Maine too, but we always study gaps looking at the pedestrian. How do pedestrians accept or reject gaps? It obviously is the motor vehicle driver that should yield, so it is motor vehicle drivers that should look for gaps between pedestrians. And the reason they in England signalize crosswalks is exactly that. In order for motorists to not be hindered in traffic, they put up signals in order to give motorists the chance to also go through the crosswalk. In the US, we don't even consider that as a reason. And uh, my second to last slide is uh, a study I just saw published in TRB. It obviously, no, sorry. Uh, now this is, sorry, this is just another comment on the same thing. Um, so I have a few more slides. This one is uh, a Honda Civic. I have traveled in a Honda Civic today. Isn't it amazing that Honda Civic sold in Europe and in Japan, and Honda sells vehicles in Japan? They all have pop-up hoods. If a pedestrian is hit by this vehicle, they got an award 18 years ago for developing the pop-up hood so that when pedestrians are hit, the, it comes up like an airbag kind of thing and pedestrians are not seriously hurt. Adult pedestrians typically hit their uh, head in the windshield and not in the, in the uh, hood, but still uh, pop-up hoods and airbags would be another good development for pedestrian safety. There are, uh, uh, I was told to talk about the human behavior and uh, I have been Looking at raccoons, when I did my postdoc in Toronto, we had a raccoon. And do you know that raccoons live in districts within arterials? They don't cross major streets. And the mothers teach their children to cross streets by walking up to the street. If they don't see cars, you run across as fast as you can. And that's kind of the strategy that we humans use too. And it works for narrow streets and for non-busy streets. So for humans, again, crossing local streets, low speed, low traffic volumes is not a safety issue. The question is, what do we do with arterials? And uh, the one thing I've been talking about is narrow streets. If we use more roundabouts, we can build many more two-lane roads. We often do not need four-lane roads we can handle the traffic volume. In order to not have high speeds at the roundabout, this is not a good design. This is a Swedish design where you go from the four lane road into the roundabout with a serious S curve to get all speeds lowered. To get rid of the four lane roads, this is from Sherbrook in uh, Quebec, narrowing down the street, telling people that it will cost money if they don't give priority to pedestrians is another way of improving safety. And uh, having one lane to cross wide refuge islands, providing underpasses wherever possible, removing the crosswalk from two lane. If there are two lanes entry, we don't have crosswalks here. We put them further away because crossing where we have double lanes is dangerous. And this is my very last slide. So my very last slide is a published study that went through the TRB uh, 
a review. Not only was it presented, it was also published. And I don't know these authors, so I have no gripe with the authors or the reviewers, but still, it shows, it says in the abstract, the result of the analysis showed that when a beacon, whether rectangular or circular, was activated, a driver was 3.68 times more likely to yield than when the beacon was not activated. Results were obtained through regression model. Um, it doesn't really say anything about safety, but let's assume that a higher yield rate is better. For pedestrian mobility, it's definitely better, even if it isn't necessarily better for safety. But what does 3.68 times more mean? Anybody here knows math? If I have one dollar and I get to 3.68 times more dollars, how many dollars do I have? Do I have a dollar 20, a dollar 50? Is that 3.68 times more? No. 3.68 times is many dollars. And in this case, if we do an example and you have activated flash and non-flash, and you come up with 300 motorist yield and 100 do not yield when it's flashing, and we have a smaller sample because most of the time it's activated, so we have 50-50. The odds ratio here becomes three. The odds ratio is three, but it is 50% yielding versus 75% yielding. 75% compared to 50% is either 25 percentage points more or 50% more. It is not 300%. It's not 300, and that's exactly the error they made. So TOB reviewers missed it, but, uh, and we can see in the data they they published that the activation improves the yield by 16, 11, 11, and 38 percent. And that's just a little detail about peer reviewing. There is quite a lot of studies that are peer reviewed and published in reputable journals where one can find errors later on. And somehow we should correct those errors and republish them corrected. Okay, I'm sorry about taking too much time. Thank you very much. Um, I know we're running out. Uh, is there any burning question in the audience over here? Let me ask uh, one burning question that I have. Um, I'm trying to understand the issue of exposure. You know, essentially, how do you measure the exposure? Because the ultimate, uh, is it based on, you mentioned pedestrian trips, pedestrian walking? How do, in order to come up with uh, appropriate measures such as you're talking about, uh, how do we get good estimates of exposure in order to compare right. apples to apples instead of apples to... Yeah. Uh, if we want to compare countries, I think the uh, mortality rate is maybe the most important. Fatalities per 100,000 people. That exposure is very appropriate when we look at public health. And then if we look at the benefit of walking, we want people to walk a lot. And therefore, looking at kilometers walked is another good measure, I think. When we want to develop crash modification factors or, or like models of how many crashes are expected, both the Swedish and British model roughly uses number of people crossing to the power of 0.5, the square root of the number. We find that when we double the number of people crossing, we don't double the number of accidents. Bigger mass is critical mass, bicycling, critical mass pedestrian. When there are more pedestrians crossing, they will be more visible. If we drive and we see pedestrians every day, we expect pedestrians there. And uh, so the empirical finding from England and Sweden using like every single intersection in the country is that number of crashes, if nothing else is changed, increases by the square root of the number of pedestrian crossings and roughly by the square root of number of vehicles too. As a pedestrian, you become more careful when there's many cars. So when we have double as many vehicles, it becomes 40% more accidents roughly. I don't know if I answered your question, but... Uh, we have a question uh, off the internet.
Um, a question from Tim Harlow. Can you say a bit more about why it is more dangerous to cross at a signalized crosswalk versus a non-signalized crosswalk? Okay. Um, if um, I think the latest data from the United States is that 40% of pedestrians killed are under the influence of alcohol and roughly 8% of drivers involved in pedestrian crashes are under the influence of alcohol. So if we start with those, if you're under the influence of alcohol, you don't care about whether there's a walk signal or not because I am strong, I am able, I am want to get somewhere. The next issue is even if you're sober, but you have to catch the bus. There's two hours until the next bus we leave, I better get there. You don't care about if there's a walk signal or not. So I think jaywalking is the major reason. We also have turning vehicles. When you have a signalized intersection, you assume that you are protected. It says walk and you walk. You don't look for turning vehicles. If it's unsignalized, you look for cars from every direction. And especially left turning cars that signals or involved in crashes at a second crosswalk. When you're making a left hand turn, you have oncoming traffic, you find a gap in oncoming traffic, and there's one more car coming, so you better gun it to not get hit by the next car, and you don't pay attention to what's going on in the crosswalk. I think that's bas basically my answer. Well, thank you very much, and please join me in thanking uh, Professor Gardner for his presentation. Thank you very much. The, the next seminar is going to be two weeks from today, and uh, it will be uh, Professor uh, Don Fisher from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. Uh, he'll be talking about distracted driving the last two seconds of your life. So again, that's two weeks from today, not next week. Next week's Thanksgiving. So two weeks from today, uh, Professor Don Fisher will be here, University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And so join us again in two weeks' time. Thank you very much. Bye.